Hello and welcome to the Lux Research Webinar. Uh, my name is Kevin C. I'm a VP of Research here at Lux, and today I'm uh, joined by my colleague Sri Ram Ramanathan, who's a Director of Research. And today we'll be discussing the myth and reality of digital transformation. A few logistical points. Uh, throughout the webinar, you can type any questions you have in the questions box on your screen. Uh, so just fire away as things come up. Uh, time permitting, we'll answer as many of those questions as we can. But if we don't get to it, well, you can always follow up with us at questions at luxresearchinc.com and we will respond. The final bit is that the slide presentation and recording from the webinar will be sent to all attendees by email in the next 48, hour, uh, next 48 hours. And with that, uh, let's dive into what the agenda looks like. And um, we're going to have a few different stages to the, to the webinar today. The first is a discussion between uh, Sri Ram and I on really that point of that myth and reality, what we're seeing in terms of success and failure and the digital transformation initiatives we see uh, so far today. Uh, but then we wanna move forward to how we can be constructive about increasing our chances of success. So we'll talk about how that correlates with maturity. And finally, we'll wrap up with a few recommendations. Um, so let's start off with a little bit of back and forth uh, between Sri Ram and I. And I wanna start with a motivation uh, for digital transformation that should be familiar to you all, but just level setting uh, why digital transformation is important. And so these are some um, stats and, and anecdotes from, from different sources. The first from McKinsey Global Institute, uh, stating essentially that AI has the capacity to deliver $13 trillion in value by 2030. Uh, another example- uh, Kevin, is, I have to interrupt you at this point. All this information that you're sharing around the potential of digital transformation is really based on this one-sided perspective of success stories that digital transformation stakeholders, that consultants are sharing with the world out there. There's this untold story uh, of digital failures, which I'm gonna get to in a minute, but nobody talks about those failures. And, and just looking at those failures, I'm not really convinced that we are even on a trajectory to achieve some of these 10, 15, 20 trillion dollars of value that people are talking about. So take this example, right? That comes from a global chemicals company, huge company present all over the world. Uh, you know, they have decades of experience in developing innovations in the lab and bringing them to the marketplace and building a successful product out of it, right? Successful revenues out of it. And so this company decides to jump into digital transformation. They're enthusiastic about it. They create a team, they dedicate some resources to it. Uh, and the team says, we're gonna focus on industry 4.0 projects because we want to improve our operational efficiency. And then even after two years, the team failed to launch a single industry 4.0 project. And that's a, that's a fair point. But I can absolutely counter that example with another Industry 4.0 success story and really broader than just Industry 4.0. And that's the story of an industrial pump manufacturer that we spoke with uh, that really managed to, to digitally transform their entire enterprise uh, from a product and business model standpoint within four years. Uh, and so really it, it was a crawl, walk, run type of approach where they uh, took took stakeholders from different parts of the business, mixed experiences, implemented agile processes, um, offered training in terms of how to think digitally and really created a startup environment um, to help people launch products uh, that are digitally enabled faster. And they saw a, a tremendous amount of success here uh, to the point where they actually disbanded an official digital transformation uh, group and actually just had it disseminate back into the business as a normal way of, of execution. Um, so there's, there's really uh, clearly an example where value can be had immediately. Karen, let's forget about all these complicated cases, right? Even something as simple as just taking data, extracting insights out of, the, out of that data, we are seeing companies fail. We just wrote about this uh, interesting company called Element AI. This company raised $250 million in venture funding. They went out there, they hired about 500 employees, many of them leading data scientists, and including Yoshua Bengio, who is the leader, world leader when it comes to deep learning. 
and then very recently we covered this company this company was sold for 230 million dollars less than what they raised leave alone the potential market cap they had and again a, a good example of, of perhaps a swing and a miss but again i keep finding the successes and i got to come back to this and this time again you know pivoting away from purely a manufacturing or industry 4.0 example is the value that can be provided to patients uh, in this case or consumer patients and so health to sync is a company with a diabetes management platform that previously we largely found to be you know, useful but rather undifferentiated um, but what they did was they actually were able to integrate fitbit data into this platform and saw a really tremendous value to their patients so in addition to the standard data such as food diary glucometer data this Fitbit data layered on top on sleep and exercise trends significantly increased the healthy behaviors that they measured in their patients and really notably decreased the average fasting blood glucose levels. So I keep emphasizing that there's reason to be bullish here. There's, there's really tangible benefits this time to, to patients. Kevin, you and I, we can keep going back and forth with examples and discussing whether the glass is half full or half empty. So let me settle this debate once and for all, just using data. So if you look at all the research data out there, all the surveys, they indicate that 85 to 95% of digital transformation projects, they end up failing. What this means is if you are the chief innovation officer or the chief digital officer, you plunk in $100 million into digital efforts, you're going to see value for only $10 million from that. That's ridiculous. Secondly, if you look at just AI projects and data science projects, 90% of those projects don't see the light of the day. They just die in the lab. People don't even deploy them on the field. And of those that are actually deployed in the field, only 30% of those projects actually scale across the organization. And this is an important data point to note because many people, uh, digital stakeholders, when they build these business cases, they're assuming that these projects are going to scale across the organization, when in reality, they don't. And I see that as a sign of failure. So you, you threw down the hammer with, uh, with the statistics. I could keep searching and finding some success stories, but I, I do agree with you in that clearly this is hard. Uh, otherwise, we'd be seeing much higher success rates. So in the rest of the webinar, we really want to explore how we understand that fine line between success and failure. And the key thing that we're going to emphasize going forward from here is that our belief from, from working with clients across the spectrum of industry, use cases, uh, and so on, is that the failures we're seeing are really due to a mismatch between the maturity of an organization and alignment with the, those digital transformation goals. So really, are you matching the maturity that you have to the actions that you're taking? And Sriram, uh, this, is, this is an area that you've led a lot of our thinking. So I think this is a good spot for you to dig into our maturity model and how we think about how that correlates with, with outcomes. You're right, Kevin. Uh, the fundamental reason why we embarked on this uh, maturity model was because we are seeing a lot of failures and we believed, strongly believe even today, that there's a mismatch between the maturity of an organization and what they are trying to target in terms of digital transformation, right? So broadly, this maturity model has multiple maturity levels, which goes all the way from one, which is the lowest you can think of, till five, which is the highest in terms of digital maturity. And when we talk about maturity, we are talking about maturity in three broad buckets. We are talking about the strategy of an organization, its ab ability to execute on digital projects, and of course, technology savviness when it comes to digital. And so to just look at some extremes out here, if you look at the strategy bucket, for example, uh, if you go to the next slide, Kevin, uh, you know, when it comes to when it comes to an organization that's not that mature with regards to its strategy, they really don't have that many resources dedicated to digital. They don't have a culture of digital. They don't even know how to launch digital business model. And 
Worst of all, there is no culture of sharing that data. It's almost non-existent. Data, are, data is sitting in silos. At the other extreme, an organization that's very, very mature with its digital strategy, they have extensive experience. All employees think purely in terms of digital. Uh, there's a strong culture of digital, so they are able to roll out these digital business models. And partly because there's this culture of sharing data, not only inside the organization, across different departments, but also with other stakeholders who are in the value chain. Likewise, if you look at the execution side of things, um, with organizations that are not that mature, they really don't have well-defined processes for digital, and as a consequence, they end up failing a lot. But if you look at organizations that are very mature, their digital processes, their governance for digital is very, very well established. And then coming to the technology piece or the technology bucket, organizations that are not mature, they have, again, very poor standards around data collection, storage, data governance, privacy, cybersecurity. And so as a consequence, they are never able to get that high level insights. So everything is human driven, Insights are human driven, decisions and actions are all human driven. And at the other extreme, everything is automated, right? Data collection, deriving insights, uh, there is this uh, attention paid to privacy and cybersecurity when it comes to data, and decisions are all completely autonomous, uh, actions are all autonomous. Thanks, Sri Ram. And I think the, the natural next step is to really look at the failures that we talked about earlier and put them in the context of this idea of maturity and these three buckets of strategy, execution, and technology. And think about, uh, in another world, how we might avoid these types of failures and, and, and give, us a, or give ourselves a better chance of success. So um, we wanna revisit the first example um, here, which is that chemical company that was very bullish on Industry 4.0, uh, but really failed to, to move the needle or deploy anything of meaning. Uh, a further anecdote is here, here is that it took about a year and a half just to find a sensor vendor. Um, so this, this is clearly a case of a strategic failure. And so if you look deeper about why they failed, what were the strategic failures? Uh, the team was small and lacked the expertise and methodologies to really act quickly and, and get big wins, drive pilots and drive scale. Uh, there was a really a lack of clear guidance from leadership about what was expected and how to move through these different gates in the process, moving towards these larger scale deployments. Um, and finally, there's help to be had along the way. Uh, what do you think about system integrators or other third parties? Uh, you don't have to do this all yourself. And if you do, you have to know when you need help and where you need it. Um, so there was really a breakdown across a number of different areas of their strategy. So if you think about how can you avoid failure? If we take this example of spending a year and a half uh, to find a sensor vendor, um, what do you have to do first? You know, if you're, if you're looking at an application like predictive maintenance, what you need to do is segment that landscape and identify the key players. So this is an example of how we do it, where a market map you know, is not just marketing fodder, it's actually, pretty useful in terms of looking at a segmentation for a landscape. In this case, we can look at the different flavors of sensing, whether it's temperature, optical, vibration, and so on. And you can determine what you're trying to sense and what insights you want out and start to go after the vendors or developers that make sense to partner with. So you need to landscape in an efficient uh, way and really understand that segmentation. So that's the first step. You need a methodology to do that. The second step is once you've got a list of potential partners, you need to further shorten that list and you need to pick one. So what you need is a very rock solid methodology for evaluating companies um, and evaluating potential partners. So this is our swing at this. This is how we do it. We use the Lux Innovation Grid, which really considers tech capability, uh, business model, go-to-market strategy and so forth. And we use it to evaluate companies. Now we know that clients also have their own unique versions of this or different frameworks for evaluation that are very specific to their needs. Whatever the case may be, you need to be able to go through that landscaping step first and this evaluative step efficiently and quickly and make sure you're covering all your, bit, your bases in terms of the questions you have and that you need to answer to move forward. 
And so if you start to put these pieces together in terms of avoiding failure, again, I'll reiterate, particularly in a space like Industry 4.0 that this chemical company was interested in, you have very simple processes to landscape, evaluate partners, and pilot. Those are the things that must be, must be done and they must be done quickly and efficiently. And when you get to the pilot stage, we do see a lot of clients struggle with what is the criteria for a successful pilot? Sometimes they feel like they're in so deep already that they have to proceed even if they're not getting results that they want. So you need to be able to set milestones that are adequate and meaningful so that you can measure the progress and, and, and success level for these pilots. And finally, everybody wants to move fast. And a lot of this is just in being lightweight in your process, whether it's a stage gate or some other version of that, you really need to minimize the overhead, minimize the bureaucracy, and you need to be able to make decisions efficiently. And whoever your stakeholders are at each of those gates, they need to make extremely clear what their expectations are on the data they require to make those decisions about whether something passes or fails. Great, so now that we have understood why these companies fail, I think it's worthwhile going back and mapping these failures onto that maturity framework that we showed earlier. So the first example, which is the chemical company that we talked about, uh, it was really a broad strategic failure. They didn't have a clear vision. They didn't know what they wanted to focus on. And so they were not mature in terms of their strategy when it comes to executing on digital projects. The second, which was from the oil refinery, was really a project management or an execution failure. They did not scope their project out well, simply because they didn't understand what are all the tasks that are involved when it comes to doing a project like machine learning for predictive maintenance or efficiency improvement. And then the last one, the AI company, the biggest point of failure here was technology. They were developing technology for the sake of developing a technology, when really they should have looked at what are the use cases in the marketplaces where people are looking for AI solutions. And that way they were gotten more traction in the marketplace. So what are some key takeaways here for all of you who are attending this webinar? First and foremost is you want to determine how you want to use digital. You want to use it in operations, do you want to use it in customer facing activities? And if so, what specific use cases and applications you want to focus on? Once you do that, you want to identify where you are today with regards to your digital transformation and where you want to be, say, five or 10 years down the line, and what are those intermediate milestones? And it's critical to do this for multiple use cases, applications you're targeting. And that's why we shared the digital maturity model today at a broad organizational level, but we have built that even for specific applications like knowledge management, uh, we have done it for robotics, uh, mobile robots, picking robots, and even health and wellness solutions. So come talk to us, we can fit, help you figure out what those milestones are and where you need to be five or 10 years from now. Secondly, try to understand your organizational digital transformation maturity. This is what Kevin and I have been repeatedly emphasizing out here. How is your strategic maturity? How is your execution maturity? How is your technology maturity when it comes to digital transformation? Identify gaps in that maturity and try to address those gaps. And again, we have a more detailed digital maturity model uh, available with us. And we have worked with many clients where we have conducted surveys with them, try to ask them questions and help them understand where they stand with regards to, regards to digital maturity, what are the gaps and how they can uh, uh, fill those gaps, how, can, how they can eliminate those gaps. And lastly, when it comes to digital, failures are unavoidable. What you can do is use this maturity approach, use this approach of, figuring out where you are today and where you want to be in the future to reduce your failures. Use agile methods and try to fail fast. We have built frameworks again, like the AI stage gate, which is purely for running AI projects. And then most importantly, use these failures as stepping stones to success. Learn something from them. Thank you very much. And we are happy to take any questions you might have.
Thank you, Sri Ram. So I will uh, I'll moderate the question portion, and both Sri Ram and I will jump in uh, and grab questions as they come. So we are taking those questions. I see some already. You can enter them into the questions box. Um, and if we don't get to it, uh, someone from Lutz will be in touch after the webinar. So the first one, Sri Ram, is for you. And uh, it's a question about broadly, there's an option to deploy digital uh, transformation efforts in either a customer facing way or more operational, kind of a product versus process. And so the question is, where do you think the, the most benefit is and where should companies focus those efforts? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, first and foremost, it's important to understand that you do need to do digital transformation. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind. Now, everybody, all your peers are focusing on the operational side of things. So it is critical that you do do digital transformation of operations. However, that is really not going to provide you much competitive differentiation uh, going looking far into the future. And so from that perspective, eventually companies should also start looking into using digital transformation on the customer side of things. Because digital transformation on the customer side of things can introduce stickiness into the marketplace, a very, very important component, especially as products and markets are getting commoditized over time. And so you can use digital transformation to reduce friction with, with, with customers, you know, with regards to your interactions, with regards to the purchasing uh, uh, decisions and so on. Uh, that's one way to use digital. The other way, which we talked about in one of our webinar, webinars late last year, was to make products that help your customers uh, do better with regards to digital transformation. Some of the examples we shared in that webinar, like Axo Noble, for example, is making these very interesting products that actually plug into the digital transformation efforts of their customers. Axo Noble, again, is a chemical company and making chemical products that would fit into that. The holy grail, of course, is merging both. And a fantastic example that comes to my mind here is from BSF. So BSF started using smart pallets to essentially track raw, track raw materials as they were shipped out to customers. So initially, it was an operational improvement just purely from a logistical efficiency perspective. But over time, they realize now we can track usage behavior of these raw materials on our customer side. And so effectively, they're starting to move to things like uh, automatically filling purchase orders, introduces stickiness into the business model, and even paper use kind of a pricing model, which again ties into the business conditions of the customers, thereby reducing risk for our customers, which again brings in more stickiness into the business. Thanks, Sri Ram. Uh, and I, I like this question, the next one, and I'll, I'll take a swing at it first, Sri Ram, is uh, perhaps a question that needs to be asked that is not being asked is this, do we really need digital transformation? And if, if so, why? Uh, and so this is something we, we did wanna attack and maybe we didn't talk about it explicitly, but uh, there's increasingly really digital skepticism. Um, is it worth doing? Can I really get value out of it? And our perspective is, is absolutely you should, and, and, and I would say have to do it. And it's not just because you're following the crowd, it's because uh, pretty soon it's going to be the cost of doing business. And so if you think about it, uh, let's start on the operational side. So if you think about industry 4.0, there is, you know, as we talked about in some of those upfront examples, there's very clear ROI to deploying something like industrial IoT. Is it hard? Yes. Is it is it clear how you get value all the times? No. You need to understand what you're looking for and you need to deploy it in a smart way, but you can get ROI and you can get payback periods and a net benefit. The danger of not doing anything at all and proceeding with the status quo is that you will become disadvantaged compared to your competitors. So it will be the cost of doing business. I'd say the bigger differentiator as, as Sri Ram has talked about um, a little bit today and, and as we've talked about in previous webinars is customer facing. And I don't just mean B2C, I mean from a B2B standpoint too. And it's that connectivity, AI analytics can enable more value for your customers. And as a result, more, more value for you. So I, I remain convinced that yes, it's absolutely worth doing. It's just hard. 
which is why we, we spent all this time talking about it, but I, I do believe it's it's something worth doing. Um, I'm cycling through some questions here. Uh, Sri Ram, one for you is, what do you recommend uh, to implement a comprehensive digital maturity assessment of an organization? Yeah, so first and foremost is, um, you know, we have we, what we shared today was really a sneak peek into the digital maturity model we have built. Uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, I'll reemphasize this. We have a more detailed digital maturity model available with discussions, detailed discussions on what is exactly involved in each of these different maturity levels. So I would definitely encourage you to look at that. And then the second piece, uh, and by the way, that's also broken up in terms of what it means uh, for, uh, for an organization to be mature when it comes to its operations versus the customer side activities. So, so it's important to look into that. The second is also once you decide where you want to do digital transformation, let's say you may say, I want to implement a knowledge management system. I want to implement something in robotics. You need to get those stakeholders into the room and again, map out your digital maturity because we have maturity models even at these levels of what does it mean by picking robots? What does it mean by maturity level one for a picking robot versus maturity level five for a picking robot? So you literally need to go through that exercise both at the organizational level, at the department level, and even the application and use case level. Clearly, it's a lot of work. Now, again, this is where we are available as consultants or as advisors out here, our experts, our analysts here, they understand the space in detail. So if you want to chat about any of maturity at any of these levels, come reach out to us. We are more than happy to do the survey with you, which we have done with a lot of other clients, and we are happy to provide advice to you as to how you can fix some of these um, maturity gaps that you're seeing in our organization. Great, thank you, Shriram. Uh, I'll field this next one, and it is about what are some common obstacles faced by those looking to implement Industry 4.0 technologies or, or use cases? Uh, and what we find is, uh, in the examples I gave, it's more for an, in the webinar, there's more immature examples of really just moving slowly due to, you know, again, that landscaping evaluation and piloting process really not being uh, structured well. Um, but if you go beyond uh, examples like that, there are definitely more mature companies who really do have a laser focus on, on understanding how they find the right vendor to scale their deployments. So it's really about scale. And so we've seen some interesting uh, frameworks and interactions with our clients. That's really, how do you assess a technology? How do you assess a vendor in a very, very rigorous way? Everything from the security it offers to the user interface, to the sensor options, there's a number of, of really rigorous ways to look at how to deploy. And I think that's a step that when you get more mature has to happen, just a really robust, robust framework for what are the questions to ask and what is the, what is the value that, that you can get out in terms of driving that scale. And so there's a threshold between how much money you wanna spend on hardware, for example, versus how much insight you wanna get out. And you need to balance those two things and make sure you understand where that insight is going to come from and how it drives a really bottom line impact. Um, Sriram, we'll do, we're going to take one more question. And this one's actually swinging over to the B2C realm. And it's in terms of how digital can drive a deeper engagement with customers. What have you seen there? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I believe many B2C companies are not placing their bets in the right place. Uh, many of them think the, the key to success or the key to engaging with customers or consumers rather is basically investing in AI and IoT. Uh, and so there are lots of connected products that are coming up. Uh, I'm not saying they're, they're, they're always the wrong decision, but in many situations, they are the wrong decision. Like this example I saw, of a Bluetooth toaster or a connected toaster that actually tells you when your toast is ready. Uh, frankly, that's not a necessity that people are going to invest in. And by the way, the toaster costs about $100. So you really, 
uh, I doubt whether customers are going to spend that kind of money or consumers are going to spend that kind of money. But the problem is developing these AI IoT products are really, really expensive. You're spending tens and million, tens of millions of dollars trying to bring them to the marketplace. So the key is to kind of take a 10,000 foot view on this. First and foremost, what are consumers looking for? What are the broad trends today? So the broad trends are cost reduction, which digital can help to some extent, but not a huge amount. But the bigger trends where digital can play a key role is creating user experiences. We are all spoiled using the iPhone, using the Apple ecosystem. Now they are looking for that in all kinds of products you're buying, right? Chairs and tables and so on. The finally risk reduction. People are always worried, I bought a product, it's not working well for me, or I don't know how to use it, or I don't know how to maintain it. So these are the key broad trends that are happening. Now, instead of building, directly jumping into building an AI IoT product for consumers, it's important to understand that your consumer engagement doesn't start just when they buy a product. It actually starts way, way before that, all the way from people becoming aware about a product, people deciding what product to buy, the very action of purchasing the product, and of course, the use of that product, which is all the way to the end. And I believe there's an enormous opportunity in just using data analytics, uh, in, in looking at, hey, what are consumers' preferences? How can I help the consumers make the right decision with regards to purchasing what they want? It's no longer about dollars. It's about bringing the right product to the right consumer. Uh, and so there's a huge amount of opportunity that re uh, remains untapped and especially as we get into these newer devices like smart home devices, wearables, all of which are generating data, there's an opportunity to analyze the data and perhaps in the future even use them as channels to sell your products if needed. So this is, there's, there's a lot of unlocked opportunity, not even jumping into IoT and sensors, just focusing on data and analyzing that data. Thanks, Sriram. And we're gonna wrap it up there uh, so thank you, uh, Sriram. Thank you to all our attendees. You know, as always, uh, lines of communication are open, so feel free to ping us. We're always happy to chat. Um, the slide presentation and recording will be sent to all attendees in the next 48 hours. There will be a survey. This is really helpful for us for building our agendas and crafting these webinars. So please do give uh, your assessment on that survey, um, and we appreciate your feedback. Uh, and with that, thanks for joining us and enjoy your day.